going to look at Titus, and we'll look at Titus chapter 2. I'm going to continue on. As I said, we had a couple of weeks off, or at least I did. I was here, but uh, had, had some preachers coming in. Um, and two weeks ago, I had a young man by the name of Brad Vogel, who had known for many years, and he came and he preached, and I liked the fact that he was preaching uh, about um, one of the things he brought up was his testimony at the end, and that is he was, he was raised in a Christian family. He went to a Christian school. Uh, I know my, my son went with him right from grade one on, right on to graduation, and they both went to the same Bible college in California. I mean, they, he, 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 was, he was in all of this stuff, and then he realized in Bible college that he wasn't saved. He wasn't saved. It was quite a testimony he gave. And that is, he didn't want to let his parents down. He didn't want to let his, his, his friends down. He didn't want to let his school down, so he went along with the flow that he was a born-again Christian, but he knew and at least came to the realization as he heard preaching, as he was gotten older, that he truly had never voluntarily accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And he was doing it for everything he was going through, all the motions he was going through was for the wrong reason. And he realized that he himself now, as a young man, must accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. And it takes some humility to do that. And he did that in Bible college, and he, he came forward and and got saved and rebaptized. Okay, and it's okay, folks. If you have doubts, a lot of people have doubts of their salvation. That doesn't mean you're not saved. Okay, but there comes a time when some people realize it that they really they got saved for the wrong reason. Again, they did it for somebody else. You do it. You get saved for you because you realize you are a sinner before a holy God, not because mom and dad will like it or because everybody else is doing it. Okay, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And so that we got that. So I, I was appreciative of, of uh, uh, Brother Vogel preaching that and giving us this testimony that he had. And he's a unique character. He doesn't get a chance to preach a lot. He was very nervous that day. And he doesn't know who you are. It's all new to him. So he's used to a small uh, church up in, uh, in, in uh, is it, I think it's Markham. Markham? Yeah, Markham. So, and then last week we had uh, Brother Jeff Roberts, uh, another old friend of mine. I, I, I'd known him since Bible college, we started off Bible college together, and uh, he uh, was last week was preaching about the encourager, and that's what's being broadcast on YouTube right now as we speak, is his message, the encourager. He was talking about the Apostle Paul was caught out for about two weeks in, in the storm and out in the sea, and these people were going without food, and there was no hope. They were, they, they, here's the thing that I learned from that is that we need encouragement when there's no hope. Because there comes a time in life where we look and we think that there's no hope. At least it's in our minds. This is it. It's over with. There's no hope. I've ruined my life. I can't. There's no... And we need encouragers in our lives to come by and say, no, your life is not over. There's always hope. you got the breath of life. There's hope. All right? The Apostle Paul was that hope to that, that crew, okay, and to all those people that were on board. And so we see that. So if there's anything I learned from that one, it's that we have to, instead, instead of just waiting for somebody to make a mistake so you can... Uh, nail them on it. We need to be encouragers. Okay, that doesn't mean we just soft soap everything, and, and that, but we have to be encouragers. It's that's one of the things we should be. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. We need to be uh, a people that give hope to people. Hope to the people that are lost that they can be found. Hope to the people who are born again Christians who maybe made some bad decisions in their lives that they can always repent and turn it around. Oh yeah, you might not uh, have everything fixed down here on earth, but between you and God done. Isn't that the amazing thing about, about confession, about admitting and getting right with God, is that he just doesn't matter what you've done, in your, even in your Christian life, doesn't matter. He is willing, if you earnestly humble yourself and confess, that means admit, confess up to him, not trying to bury it, not trying to try to make excuses, you come up to him, he will, he says he will forgive. How many times? Seven times a day? No, 70 times, seven times a day. In other words, ongoing. His mercy is new every day. We looked at that on one Wednesday. It's fresh every day. His mercy every day. Come out every day. You get up, wake up, and take on a new dose of mercy from God. He's got it for you. Okay. I know we get weak in the flesh, and we're not always there to encourage people like we ought to. But He's always there. His word is always there to encourage us. So let's let's make sure that we get into that. So if we look at it, going back to before we had these two preachers, I had talked about God's formula for building, uh, for building godly families. And it was in the book of Titus that really caught my attention, Titus chapter 2. And if we look there, please, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. 
we'll see that there's, there's a, a formula that God presents that hits every age group in a church, or every age group within a family, a Christian family. So Titus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, but, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in, in charity, in patience, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may lead the younger women to be sober, to love their, their husbands and, and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, excuse me, chaste, keepers at home, good, uh, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, uh, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. As we look into the word, help us, Lord. We need to be fed by your word today. We need to hear from you. And we, Father, help us to take to heed the words of the Apostle Paul to this young preacher, Titus. Help us to build our, ourselves, Lord. Help us to work within our family unit and help us within our own church, Lord, to be the things that you want us to be here in this chapter, chapter 2. Help us to grow to be more like our Savior. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I asked a couple weeks ago or three weeks ago, I said, who wants to be a part of a godly family? And it's like, yeah, I want to be a part of a godly family. Because uh, if you let it go naturally, we all know what it's like to be a part of a not so godly family. But he's talking here about being a family. And, and you, you have to, you've got to kind of work at it. And you, who else, by the way, would know how to build a godly family other than God himself? Because it's a godly family. He is the author of us. He created you. He made you. He's like, like a production line, and I guess in a way, when we make automobiles and other things, we, the people who have designed it and built it, they know what's going into it. Well, who built and designed us? It wasn't evolution, I'll tell you. It wasn't just some kind of spark or some explosion, some weird random event that, that no, you're, you're fearfully, you're wonderfully made, folks. And the great creator, he, he built you, he designed you, and he knows every part about you and me, and he knows how we interact with each other because he designed it a certain way. He also knows that sin has now entered into the world and that we're marred and we're twisted and we're bent by that sin. And so he's giving us instruction. This is from God himself, giving us an instruction as born-again Christians how to take that twist and how to straighten it out his way. Okay, not through man's philosophies, but his way. In Titus chapter 2, verse 1, is just one more, one, one more thing that really helps us to do this. And in this letter, Paul uh, includes God's recipe for building a godly family. And this epistle was written by the Apostle Paul to encourage Titus, who was now going to become this, this young pastor in, in, in this, this island of Crete, which was an island that had many different towns and villages in it. And it had a particular church that was planted there. And he was kind of commanding him. He says, you know, you know the, the people in Crete aren't the nicest of people. Okay? And they didn't all have a godly background. They didn't all have, like, they're, they're coming from the world. So you, you've got building blocks in your church, uh, people that are, are not just born again, but they're born again with this, this old problem, these old philosophies. They're still in their lives. And I can guarantee you this, that when you got saved, you took some of that old baggage into your new life with Christ. We all did. And we have to kind of chisel and work away at that. That's the word of God's doing here. And that's what, that's what he's saying. He says, he said, Titus, you've got some building blocks there, but they're a little bit messed up. And you're going to have to do some work here. And let, let me tell you from God's divine uh, point of view how to do it. So, so he gives Pastor Titus... Uh, uh, a reminder, and if you go back there, if you got Titus chapter 1, just go back a, a page, Titus chapter 1, verse 12. He reminds us, and uh, reminds Titus, and he shows for us, we looked at it a few weeks ago, what type of people. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 12, it says, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And so, I mean, that doesn't sound so good, all right? 
So this is what you got to work with, young man. You're going to be pastoring this church. You got these people. I mean, and he says they're always. In other words, it's a perpetual way of life for them. This is what you got to work with. These people got saved. They got baptized. They're forming a church. I want you to stay behind. I want you to pastor this church. But remember, Titus, they're always. This is the way that they were raised. This is their way. They're liars. In other words, they can't be trusted with the truth. Boy, that's very difficult, isn't it? How do you build a church with a bunch of liars? And yet, this is what he says, even one of their own said this. Even one of their own prophets, even one of their own family members said this is the way we are here on Crete. Okay, they're always liars. They're evil beasts, and we looked at that before, and that means evil beasts means that they, they were uh, injurious. They would injure somebody. They would be brutal. They would be savage. They would be ferocious if you ever crossed them. Okay, or, or, or beat them in bowling or, or, or mini golf. They would be ferocious. Okay, this is what you're working with, hey? Eh? And I know Mike McDonald. I know him. I know I can turn like this, hey? Eh? Because all you can too. We, there's a part inside of us that just tick it off. You know, maybe it's you're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off. Maybe something else happens. And we can turn from this uh, Mr. or Mrs. Nice to a real Mr. or Mrs. Miserable real quick. Well, these people, this was their way of life. It wasn't just once in a while. This was their way of life. He said, they're always like that. Evil beasts. And in slow bellies, they, they were idle gluttons. I mean, they were fat and lazy. So if you go to that next picture there, and I showed you this picture there, that's your typical Crete uh, from, from uh, Crete. I mean, it's, it's like this old bear. And again, he looks, the bears look cute. They're cuddly, aren't they? Try to go up and cuddle one, okay, one in the wild like that, and see what you get. They can, they'll, they can, they will turn on you. I mean, here's a meal, man. You don't uh, get in their, their path. So that was a, a Christian. So he was trying to prepare this man. This is the church you've got to build with. And somehow, somehow, you, you've got to work on this. And, 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 and this is what they resembled here. And Paul knew that uh, way back then that a strong church relied on strong families. And, but the families, if they were like this, can you imagine if every member was like this angry lazy old bear i mean you're going to have some really wonderful church uh church services aren't you there's going to be some miserable times you're going to have some some interesting things the, the family will turn on you they'll turn on each other and everything else like this this is what he had to work with so this is why he starts talking about the different ages or the different layers of people that make up uh, the church and, and each of the families you got to build strong families we have to have strong families if we're going to have a strong church Okay, it's, uh, it's the way it is. So we have this here. And so the, number one, the, the first step, if we, if we go to the next slide, we see there in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 1, it says the first step is the preacher. The first step is the preacher. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So it all starts with the Word of God. All right? If you're going to build strong families, and if those strong families are going to carry over and build a strong church, it all starts with the Word of God. That's what we have from God. That's all we have from God. We don't have some kind of religious relic around here that we all bow down and worship to. We have the Word of God, and we worship the true God in spirit and in truth. And it's His, His truth, His Word is found right in the Bible that you have right before you. And if you don't have one, let me know. We can get you one. And if you don't have one, you've got a cell phone, you can get them free on the cell phone apps. I mean, the Bible is there, but it's got to be read. It's, it's important. So we see the first step here is the preacher. He is, he's designed by God not to just be a supporting leg to a table, but he is supposed to be the backbone. The backbone to be building strong families and strong churches has to be the preacher. He has to be able to be able to preach the sound doctrine to people. Um, and so he says here that we're supposed to, to preach, uh, or the pastor's supposed to preach sound doctrine. Why? If we go to the next slide, and I'll just kind of give you a synopsis of it. Uh, why? Verse 2, that the aged men be, okay? Then you go to the next one, verse, verse 3, that the aged women likewise, that they be. Verse 4, uh, that they may teach the younger women to be. And then verse down to verse 6, it says, Young men likewise exhort to be. Why preach, preacher? Why take the Word of God? Why take the truths in the Word of God? Why take those godly principles? Because you want people to become something, them to be something. You want to be something, don't you, with your life? Don't waste it. God's given you precious life, and He's given you precious eternal life once He saved you. So God did that for a reason, because He wants you to be something. 
And he's going to tell us in a minute what it is. And we're going to look at it today. We're going to look at the aged men. And next week, we'll look at the aged women. If we got to, or, or the weeks after, we're going to look at the aged women. We're going to look at the young women and, and the young men. We're going to look at this because it's very important because God wants us to be something. And I like that because people want to be something. And, and it's like, but sometimes we wonder, what is it we're to be? What, what should I be? Well, he actually lays it out for us, and we're, we're going to look at this. So verses, chap, uh, verses 2 to 8 all lay out what each of the family member, no matter who they are, whether male, female, or what age group they're in, what they should be, what they should be. But one thing I do know that we're not supposed to be, we're no longer supposed to be those bears. Okay, just laying around there, fat and lazy, doing nothing, living for ourselves, just waiting for somebody to tick us off so that we could just claw them. All right, that's not what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to replace that with a new life. And so it all starts there again in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And that speaking here refers to old-fashioned preaching. If you want to know what that word means, you look it up. It's old-fashioned preaching. Get some preaching going here. With a, I mean, stop talking about the philosophies and, and having reading rooms and get out there and do some preaching. And that's one of the things that we don't do a lot of in churches anymore. We have drama. Big, that's a big thing nowadays. It's been a big thing for the last 10 years is drama. People come in and they'll do all kinds of drama. Uh, they'll do, you know, sing songs. You know, you have all these people do singing. They'll have reading rooms. They'll have everything else. But the preaching time gets narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. But as we're going to see in a minute, that's supposed to be flipped around. It's okay. I don't mind drama. I don't mind singing. I don't, I don't mind uh, taking time and reading and doing things and discussions. I don't mind that. In fact, we do that here. But it's never supposed to crowd in on the time of speaking the sound doctrine, the preaching. Because that is what's going to, as we're going to see here, that's what's going to get people saved, and that's what's going to get people to grow. So we need that. So we need, uh, um, in other words, the pastor's responsibility to the families in his church is to preach factual, healthy principles solely from the Word of God. You do not want to hear my philosophies, because they're just my philosophies. You want to hear from God today. I hope that's what you want. You want to know the truth. You want to hear from that. And there's a lot of philosophies out there. There's a lot of so-called theologies that man has gotten involved with. We need to get back and stay back in the Bible and let the Word of God transform us. I'm telling you, the Bible that you have uh, is, it was given to us from heaven. It's, as I said, it's not just supernatural, it's eternal. It's beyond that. It has words that, and if you get into it and you start to appreciate it, it will start to change you as a born-again Christian. And if you're not born again Christian, it's going to convict you that you need to get saved. And if you are saved, it's going to convict you to carry on and keep walking with Jesus. Get to know Him better. Get to have Him. Tra and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a spiritual thing that can't be reproduced by any other mechanism on earth. It's supernatural. It's, it's beyond, and I don't want to bring it down to supernatural. You're going to think about uh, Superman and Spider-Man. It's beyond that. It's eternal. Okay, And it's going to change you. It will change you. That's all I can say. So we need to spend time in the Word of God. So, so preach, preach. And we'll go to the next slide, please. Preach why? That the aged men, as he starts off with the aged men in verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. And so that's what I want us to look at this morning. And I want us to look at, first of all, number one. Why? Preach to that the aged men be sober. What does that mean? It means abstaining from intoxicants, especially wine, that will throw you off and that'll, that'll dull your observations. In other words, God says that the age of it, we have to start, first of all, with the preacher. Secondly, we need to have, this is a formula, this is a process. Secondly, we need to have men in the church. How many times you go to church and there's no men there? Just women. Nothing wrong with just having women, but what happened to the men? That the men who are supposed to be there, they're, they're out doing everything else under the sun, but that the, the, the especially the aged men, let the aged men be sober. In other words, make sure that you're preaching and, and preach against the, the, the evils of alcohol and drugs. And boy, do we have alcohol and drugs. You want alcohol and drugs, go to the government. They'll give you them left and right. They're just falling out. They're making money off it. Lots and lots of money off. They're, the biggest drug dealer I've got is not the guy down the end of the street. And there is a guy down the end of every street selling them. 
The biggest drug dealer we have is the government, and we pay for it. So we're actually, in a way, in the drug business, okay? And I'm not talking about just people who are ill and need some medicine. I'm talking about people who are taking drugs to get high, to get intoxicated because they can't cope with the world. So this is what the world's got to offer you, okay? You've got a problem. Here, let me space you out some more, dole out some more stuff. And some of the, the biggest drug that we have, the most dangerous drug we have is not fentanyl, it's alcohol, okay? Because everybody's starting to get it, and they got it in their houses. And I, 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 here's where I'll get preaching. I'll get off my notes because I don't care anymore about that. But I do know this, is that when you get into intoxicants, you lose your keen observation of how you should stand before God. You lose that. You cannot, you cannot be intoxicated and live for God. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit when you're, when you're downing uh, something that's going to make your mind not, not focus, not, not operate anymore. It, 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 yet we've got, and this is the thing that really bothers me, is that we have so many preachers today who want to avoid preaching against alcohol. Number one, either because they themselves like it, or number two, they're afraid of people. Well, let me tell you, I don't care what you think about me after this, not on this issue. Do not get into booze, especially as it, he just na nails it right here for the aged men, the men who should know better, the men who are supposed to be out there. He said, get off that booze stuff because it'll destroy you in your Christian testimony, your Christian lives. And everybody else is going to be hanging in, in your family, is going to be depending on leadership. How can you lead them if you're always got your bloodshot eyes and you're not always there with them? How can you do it? If you're always trying to escape reality, how are you going to lead them? It takes work. So we've got to get off the booze. We've got to get back into the Word of God. And we don't have enough men in our churches anymore because we don't have enough men in their homes being the man that they should be. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't drink. Okay? You don't have to be ashamed of that. And the world, the world will try to, you know, try to get you into this stuff. And... Uh, I tell you, when one is drunk, the devil doesn't have to work hard, does he? He doesn't have to work much. He doesn't have to do much. He doesn't even break a sweat when we give over to the flesh. He doesn't have to work. He's got us. All right? But when you're sober, when you're keen, then you're a problem to him. Okay? You're a problem to him. And I cannot believe, as I said, how many preachers, so-called mature Christians as well, will defend social drinking. Why would you defend that? Why wouldn't you defend the Word of God? Why wouldn't you defend, defend sobriety and, and, and being, I don't want to use the word high, but being filled with the Holy Spirit? Because you can't have both. You have to choose. Why would you do that? And yet we, we seem to, to get into that area. And I'll tell you something, you be, be careful, because there are Baptist preachers that are getting dabbling in this, or they're looking the other way. It needs to be preached on from time to time, okay? Just by being sober doesn't make you saved either. You need to be saved by Jesus Christ. But if you are saved, you need to get sober. You need to stop. I mean, cut it out completely. That's what this word means. So that's why I'm taking time on it. Be so with the, the, it's the first of the list, okay? So I didn't mean this to be uh, a message just on alcohol, but I noticed God put it at the first of the list. Speak sound doctrine, preacher. Remember, they're all a bunch of bears there, a bunch of slow bellies, a bunch of bears. Why? Number one, at the aged men, and start with the aged men. Don't, don't expect the young men and the young ladies first. Let's start with the old first, okay? If you're going to be mature, act mature. Number one, to act mature, get out of the booze, okay? So sober. So we see that. And uh, if, if the, I mean, just, I, I just found that uh, if, if you look at it, and you got booze in your house, what I would advise is do this. It's just pour it down the drain, and if you want to smash the bottles or do, discard them however you want, don't take them back for, for any money or whatever they're given these, these days. Just forget it. Let it go. Let it go. Trust me. Trust, trust God, actually. Trust God. Be sober. Start to live again. Start to breathe again. You can't be an alcoholic if you don't drink. You can't be. You cannot be a, oh, the poor person, he's addicted. Yeah, I know, he's got an addicted person. I got that. But you know what? He wouldn't have gone down that road if he never had his first drink. And I know this because, you see, I come from a, a fish town. They were all fishermen where I grew up in Port Dover. My whole family, my cousins, everybody were in the fishing business. And you know what? After they got back off the lake, first thing they would do is go to the hotel. They, they didn't make a lot of money. But they took what little they had. Did they have it for their family? Some did. The smart ones did. Others went to the hotel and, and, 
and took that, that cash and gave it to the bartender and had a few drinks and they went back home and then they were laying down there on the couch all day and were useless for the rest of the day for their family. Okay, so the next morning they got up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning to go out again. That was their life. And I'm saying to people, man, there's such a better life in that. But you see, the people are so caught up in the things of the world, the intoxicants of the world, that their, their lives, they're just throwing it away and they don't even see it. I don't want to do they, that. They, I want to be a part of seeing people ransomed from hell and redeemed and, and saved. And I want so bright. I want people to understand that God has so much more to offer you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Understand true joy. Even when you're crying with somebody, when you got that peace with God, it's better than these people crying in their booze with no hope. So he, he really gets that. He gets to that. He says that the age of men be sober. Then he says the next thing, if you go to the next slide, grave. That they be grave, and that is one who is respected due to his age and his wisdom. Aged men should be centers of respect. All right? And I know, I know that to have a healthy church, you have to have older people and all the way down to the nursery. That's a healthy church. And I've been in churches where all there is, is where I'm the youngest guy there. And I've been in those churches where I am the youngest person there, and it's like, oh, that's not good because there's nobody coming up. But I've also been on the other side, which is really big popular today, where everybody's hip and young, and where's the seniors? Well, we don't cater to them anymore. We changed our music. Well, what about the seniors? Oh, we have two services. One's for the older people, and then we have the ones with, for the younger people. And it's all divided down by music. What a bunch of garbage that is. What's a stupid thing that is? Because that's, it's hellish because it's not in the doctrine of God. It's a called out assembly of every age group, and it's listed right here in Titus. It starts with the old people. And you know why? Because the aged men are to be testaments. Just like if you go into a town square in some of these, these older towns, whether it be in Canada or in Europe or something, they'll, they'll have a statue, somebody that they revered, somebody that he, maybe a founder or somebody that did something great for that community. And they'll put that statue up there. And that's what he's saying here about being grave, that the the, the aged men would be able to be, in a flesh and blood form, the testimony of what it is to be a Christian. You see, seniors have an important part to play in a church. And if you are young, be careful because you will become a senior if you live long enough. You will become a senior. And so as you do, your life is not over serving Christ. What, I missed something, didn't I? You'll get old. You'll get old. That beautiful black hair will go gray. Trust me. All right. And that's what I'm saying is that we need to respect and revere our seniors because we ourselves, we would want that when we're that age. And the other thing is, is if, is if uh, and I found that there's no retirement program in God's plan. It's not, a, he's like, he's, ex this is pretty heavy stuff. Okay. This is pretty heavy stuff he's laying. He starts off with the aged men. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I've been living my life all this. Can't I just take a break? No. No, your life's not over. Now you've got to be that, that, that statue in the, in the town center. You've got to be the person that people look up to. And one day I want to be like that person. And why can't we be more like that person? Because you've had time to wither the storms. And you've understood what it's like to walk with God during hardships. And, 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 and so these things that, that are happening. And I tell you something with the, our COVID and the, 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 you know, the, the war that's, that's going on over in Europe and all these things, people get nervous. But people have been around for a while. We turn to them for stability and strength of what it's like to hold the faith and not give up, all right? So this is why he's, I want you to be grave. I want, I want the aged men, I, I want them to be breathing testaments of the holiness of God. And how many times do we see in movies and in TV shows how they offer up our fathers and our grandfathers as nothing more than idiots and buffoons? And that's the, what the world does. You know, if you, if, if, well, gone are the days of father knows best. Now it's our, my dad's a buffoon, okay? He's, he's useless. Or my grandfather, he's just a dirty old man, you know, and stuff like that. That's what we promote. We, we promote it again and again and again. And that can be that way. But God says, I want you to flip that around. And it starts with the preacher. He says, you preach sound doctrine. And you put them to mem remembrance. These, these, start with the aged men. Don't, and we're, I notice it's easy to hit the kids. Hey, kids, you should be like this. No. He says, hit the old people first. Start with the men. Say, men, this is what you should be. You should be that testimony. You should be that place of respect. And so let's not go the way that the world wants to go. Let's place it up into a, an honorable position. 
okay? That's a challenge for us men, okay? Because as we get older, we get weaker. And yet, spiritually speaking, the Bible says we should be even stronger, all right? Third thing, temperate. Temperate in this list. And temperate means to curbing one's desire and impulses. In other words, to have self-control. Why do the aged men need to be taught this by the preacher? It's because there's a tendency and there, there, there's this, this tendency and this temptation to relax, and to lower your guard as you get older. Right, Rod? No, okay, Rod's not. He's the testament that we all need to look at. Look to that man there. We need not let our guard down because we're older, okay? And as it, Hey, listen, as I've said before, Freedom 55 and all these other slogans. Hey, when you're 55, you can retire and just go out to the, the, the links and play some golf and take it easy and your life is just enjoyable until you die. Just, just you know, you, you, that's not God's plan. That might be London Life's plan or Canada Life's plan, but it's not God's plan. He says, you got something. Until you breathe your last breath, aged man, you have got to be temperate you keep yourself under control and you say but you don't understand i i've worked all my life i've had to, i've had i mean i had my children as they were young and they were looking up to me i had to be this example to them can i just let it go now god says no because that's the temptation but i worked so hard i i, I can why can't i just let it can i maybe skip a few church services maybe i can get involved with some social drinking maybe i can let my guard down god says don't do it don't do it don't do it keep keep your guard up keep your guard up don't think don't blame it because of that and i want to show you this and, and uh, i hope you came prepared for a little longer sermon actually got at least 10 minutes here but i want you to, to turn over to first samuel because i want to show you something 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to compare this one man when he was young and the same man when he's old. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see the story of a young David and Goliath. Later on, we're going to look at 2 Samuel. We're going to look at an older man, David, and Bathsheba. He's different now. Okay, so but when you look there, and you see there, 1 Samuel 17, verse 20, it says, And David rose up early. Look at that. You see that? He rose up early. He rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the, the host was going forth to fight, and he shouted for the battle. So we have this young David, and his dad says, I want you to take some food, and I want you to also bring back a report to me what's going on in this war between, between Israel and the Philistines. Go, and he says, I got up early in the morning. He couldn't wait to go. He was on fire. He says, yes, my, my dad has told me to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, and he, left, he, he made sure that the sheep were not just scattered around. He left them with the proper keeper, and he took off early in the morning. He took off. This was the young David. And look there in verse 22, 1 uh, Samuel chapter 17, verse 22. And David left. Here he is again. He's, he gets to the battle. And he, he's always leaving things behind to go forward, to press forward. He left his carriage in the hand of the keeper uh, of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Now look down there to verse 48. 1 Samuel 17, verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. Here it is, that David hasted and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. All right, so you see this young man, David, and you see why God chose him and, and, and made him the, the, the really, the, he was the second king of Israel, but he was really of this dynasty. The dynasty of Jesus Christ was built upon David because you can see what this young man was like in his younger days. So he hasted, he, he ran, he was, he was moving forward, always advancing. Now, he becomes an aged man. That's being talked about in Titus chapter 2. Look over to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to compare the victorious story of David and Goliath with the tragic story of David and Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 11.1 1 says, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, 
after the time when kings go forth to battle. Remember David? He used to go forth to battle. He used to run into the battle. He wasn't afraid. He ran into it. So there comes a time, he's later on, he, he's successful now, he's the king. And, and the kings are going to battle again. It says here that David sent Joab. Young David would never send Joab. It'd be father, send me. It'd be King Saul, send me up against this, this ungodly Philistine. I'll show him. But now he sends Joab. Joab was his general. So here's the king, and the kings are supposed to go to war. The kings in those days led the battle. And what does he do? He sends his general. General Joab goes. So, so he sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. So all these men went. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. So they went to battle. They fought. They had victory. And they had, they had, they, they had the spoils here. And they sent word back to the king, and David says, no, I'm still going to stay here. He's still, I mean, time, days, several days have gone by, and he's still not going to go out to the battle. He's no longer the young David he used to be. He's an aged man, but he's not an aged man who's supposed to be what God's telling him to be. He's not, he's not temperate anymore, is he? He's not, he's not keeping his guard up. He's, he's lost his self-control and his, his will. And then look there in verse 2. This is that he, 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 he tarried in, still at Jerusalem in verse 2, and it came to pass in eventide. But remember, remember young David, it was early in the morning he rose. Now we see an older man. And at eventide, David arose from off his bed. Wow. Lounging around all day. He's the king. People tell him, hey, listen, you've got to come. Great things are happening. That's fine. I'm going to stay here in the palace. I'll sleep for the day. I've deserved it. Freedom 55 and all, you know. I, I've done all that. So he rises from off his bed, and, and he, the word is walked upon the roof. He wasn't running anymore. He walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the young woman was very beautiful to look upon. And we'll just stop right there because you, know, you get to know the story of David and Bathsheba. And, but what I wanted to compare was an old David to his younger counterpart that was successful, a young David. One who was always, had a quick mind, and he was always looking for a battle to fight for the Lord. What happened was there's a difference. Young David had a cause. Old David lost the cause. That's what it was. It was a mental thing. He lost his cause, his purpose. And that's what happens to us old guys when we get shifted, shafted off to the side. I remember, now you can, man, now we need people to work, so you can work till you're 100 if you want to. But I remember when my mom was got turned 65 in her office, she had to retire. I mean, you have to make way for the young people. Now there's not a whole lot of young people, so you've got to stay on. But th there, there's always been this thing, even in churches, where the, young, the old people, they have to kind of, we'll shuffle them off to the side. Oh, we'll give them their own church service, but we've got to keep going on with our services and stuff like that. And what happens is that the old, because the preacher... If the sound doctor's not preaching it, he should smarten up and say, these old people are important, very valuable to us. These aged men are very... And he should be preaching at the aged men as much as he is at the young men. You better smarten up and you better start living for God because you'll end up like David. And if you know what David's story is after he sins with Bathsheba and you see what happens to his family and the heartbreak he has and it goes from generation to generation to generation, what a disaster happened. Why? Because he became an aged man, but did not become the aged man that was found in Titus chapter 2. He let his guard down. <clears throat> so I take you all to this, that he was no longer temperate. He now was now desperately lacking in self-control. And many of us, when we age, we grow slow, we grow tired, and we tire of fighting, folks. I'll be honest with you. After a while, if you're not careful, you don't keep close contact with God. If you don't have that renewing of the Holy Spirit inside of you. As you get older, you've seen it all before, and you get weary in well-doing. And we're commanded not to be weary in well-doing, because it can happen. You can get tired, and you just say, no, no, no. Folks, we do not get a retirement program in spirituality here. Okay? So verse 1, the preacher is to be preaching, and he's to preach all this sound doctrine. And then the last three things he said, we see the first three things here, that they'd be sober, 
and they'd be grave, and that they'd be temperate. And then the last three are all about uh, that we are supposed to be sound in something. We are to be, first of all, sound in faith. And by the way, it says, also says charity and patience. Those three are all linked together. Sound in, sound in, sound in, even though it doesn't always say sound in. They all, they're all linked together. So we're to be sound in, uh, first of all, we're to be sound in faith. And that means to be strong and healthy in the convictions that Jesus Christ is the Messiah through whom we obtain the salvation and entrance into the kingdom of God. We have a new life here. Let's live that new life in faith. We got there by faith. Let's continue on in faith. We need to have that. Now, here's one thing I want to bring out, and I'll ask you to please turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. I won't keep you much longer, okay? We'll be up by 2 o'clock, easy, okay? But, but Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, 17. I want you to see this. I want you to see this because I, I, I can't say this one hard enough. And, and it just, when I started studying this passage, it jumped out at me. It's, it's a passage we could, most of us could quote anyway. But Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by what? Hearing. No, it comes by watching, doesn't it? Don't you want to see drama? No. Don't you want to see a musical? No. It comes by singing. No. no. It comes by reading comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so hearing what the word of God twice the word hearing is used here and it's talking about your faith and as we see there in Titus that we're supposed to be sound of faith and that links back to where he says in verse 1 he says but 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 Titus speak preach speak audibly the things that are sound doctrine to these people why why? Because it says here, if you go back over here to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, because it's through the, the ears, it's through the hearing, it's through that personal touch of the human voice that people get saved. They realize that they need a Savior, and they need to grow after they're saved. It's through preaching. And the reason I have you go to that verse, because I want to show you something. You cannot replace a live service with what's on TV or on the Internet. Okay, those are helpful things when we have to. It's like anything else. If it's like a second best, it's good. It's good. I mean, you can still hear preaching in that. But there's something about being in the same room and hearing it firsthand. You can't replace that. Now go over here. First, uh, First Corinthians chapter one. First Corinthians chapter one verse twenty. I'm going to link this to here again. First Corinthians chapter one verse twenty. Hearing, we got to hear. There's nothing. This this is God's plan. Yes, reading helps. Yes, you can use drama and music and all that stuff can help, but nothing replaces the power of speech. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now notice verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Here it is. It pleased God by the foolishness of what? No, it's watching. It's reading. It's singing. It's drama. It's everything else. But you go to churches, I'm telling you some folks, you go to churches today, that's, what, that's the kind of the stuff, and I don't even want to say it's garbage, it's just stuff that's it's clouded over, and there's just a few minutes for a guy to get up and do a little sermonette for you. But what does God say? God says there that in, in, uh, in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, that this is God's plan. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The foolishness of preaching. And it says there in verse 22, it says, for the Jews require a sign. In other words, they want to watch. They're, the Jews are looking for, hey, what can... Jesus says he's the Messiah. Well, the Messiah should walk on water. So he walked on water. He did all these things. Did they get saved just because he was walking on water? Because he raised people from the dead? Because he, he restored hearing to the, the people who couldn't hear and, and speech to the people who couldn't speak? They saw that. It still didn't help them. Many of them still turned their backs on God. But that's what the Jews were looking for. They were looking for sciences. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Oh, they're reading their books. They're reading their books. Oh, they got their big libraries great scribes and authors and they would dispute and debate and, and they would have this dialogue and they would talk about what they read last. They were well-read people. He says that the, the Greeks, were, that this is where their wisdom came. It, it came from reading. And then look at verse 23. But we what? Preach. But we preach. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But we preach. 
Yes, I understand this, folks. I, and, and the world must look at us sometimes and think we're crazy. But I'll tell you something, it's the, it's the, the foolishness of, of God, is, and he says it later on, it's much better than the wisdom of man. The weakness of God is much stronger than the strength of man. So why don't we just do it God's way? Why don't we just submit and why don't we demand that our churches be built upon good preaching? Why? Going back to, to Titus, and I'll, I'll just get you back there. Again, I apologize for the time. I didn't know it was going to be this long. That they be sound in their faith. Okay? That they be sound in their faith. Faith cometh by hearing. And, and again, Titus chapter 2, verse 1 said, But speak, but speak to other things which become sound doctrine. And then we'll, we'll just really close it off quickly with sound in charity. That they not only be sound in faith, but they also be sound in, in charity. And that is having a strong and healthy, godly love. And yes, it's the same word that we have in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God's love is a love that gives, does not take. That's lust, okay? That's the world's love. How many times do they have movies today? Oh, they're in love. Yeah, this week they're in love. Next week they're in love with somebody else. What about the other person they were in love with? No, they took them, used them, squeezed them up like, a, like an old uh, can, uh, uh, aluminum can, and threw them off to the side. That's not love. Love gives. Love sacrifices. Love's there for you all the time. God's love. And that's why people sometimes wonder if God still loves me. Yeah, you're, you're mistaking God's love with man's love. God does not go fickle on us like man does. I'll love you and I'll sign that marriage document, but uh, we'll have a prenuptial agreement just in case. That's love, isn't it? Aren't you glad that when you got saved, God did not have a prenuptial agreement with you? But... If you no longer love me anymore, I'm going to depart from you and I'm going to leave you with what you brought into this relationship and I'll take what I brought into this relationship. What kind of salvation is that? No wonder people are wondering if they're still saved. It's because we're, we're, instead of taking God's love and transferring it on what we should be, we take man's love and we transfer it on what God, we think God is like. God's not like us, folks. And he's saying to the aged men, I want you to be like God. I want you to have that love God has. That love that doesn't quit, that endures, that's there, that doesn't use up, but puts in. And then finally, finally, we'll, we'll jump over to this, and we'll get into uh, not only to be sound in those areas, but there to be sound in patience. And I'll, I'll end here, and that's strong and healthy loyalty to the faith. In other words, don't give up. Be patient. Be endurance. The, the Christian life is a long-distance run. It is not a sprint. And that's why he's saying this to the aged men. He said, you aged men, do not think this is a sprint, and now you're off the hook. It's a long-distance run, the whole full distance of your Christian existence here on this earth. So therefore, you need to be healthy and strong in your patience, in your endurance, in your loyalty to, me, loyalty to God. Do not turn back from God. There's a lot. And I say this, this, there's a lot, because us old guys, as we get older, there's the tendency, we are physically weaker, slower, okay? But spiritually speaking, God still holds the bar up even higher. <laughs> even higher, okay, Dan? All right, Dan, okay, Dan knows what he's saying. Yeah. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. Lord, I know we have to shorten it because of time, Lord, but... Uh, enough said for the aged men. You've said it well. You've challenged us well. Help us, Lord, as aged men. Help us to be what you want us to be, according to Titus chapter 2. And Father, for the younger people, help us to uh, help them to, to support us and encourage us not to give up, but to be in, enduring, Lord, to be the examples. Hold us up. Hold us accountable, Lord. And Father, we'll thank you for it, and we ask that you bless this church, Lord, in a very mighty and strong way. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.